Hi, hey everybody, and welcome to another exciting edition of Words, Images, and Worlds. Delighted on this episode to be talking with comics creator Matt Haley. Matt, thank you for jumping in, taking a few thank minutes. Thank you, Jason. With me. My pleasure. Thanks, happy to be here. Yeah, I, I appreciate your work a great deal and have for some time being a longtime comics reader and it's it's really the work for dc i think that initially captured my interest uh, yeah. because i started as a dc reader oh yeah so did i yeah, yeah. so uh particularly elseworlds is uh a series not a series necessarily <laughs> imprint wh whatever you might call elseworlds that i've enjoyed and also enjoyed the yeah. work you've done for characters like batgirl and, and things of that thanks nature. it's it's been a minute. The Elseworlds thing was the <clears throat> kind of a project that was a long time in coming. And I wanted to do a sequel to it forever, but the business has changed so much. And almost there's almost no one left at DC that I even worked with. So I don't think it's going to happen. We did get to make toys. We made action figures of Batgirl and Supergirl. So that was cool. That's right. Very cool. Very cool. I, I remember those well and enjoyed those also. Um, so... As you look back, I think the first question that I have is something about the the most positive experiences, the contributions to comics um, that you feel that you've made so far in your career. I mean, that's kind of a <clears throat> kind of a broad question. Um, hang on, just a sec. I'm in LA, so the air is not great here. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Sending the I good think, vibes. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, what I enjoyed is that for a while I was part of a studio called Studiosaurus, which I don't know what it's called now, but it was me and my college roommate, Tom Simmons. I became his anchor for a number of years, mm -hmm. or his penciler, rather. He became my anchor. Um, we get into the business together, and then he got to go off and work with a bunch of other a bunch of other cool artists. It was me and him, Aaron Lepresti, Terry and Rachel Dodson, Ann Timmons, Matthew Clark, uh, David Hahn for a little while, Steve Lieber. Uh, Carl Kiesel, Gary Martin, and then sometimes floaters like Kevin Nolan and whatnot would come show up and hang out. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. I think the experience that I had with that is that it made me love what I was doing because I had all these friends and artists to sit and, and learn from. And I think that the most positive contribution would be that I was able to take that and use it in my film and TV career by remembering how I was um, sort of shepherded by some of the older artists in our studio, most notably Aaron Lepresti. I mean, Aaron taught me how to spot shadow areas on a figure. His mm -hmm. trick was to, this is back in the old days when we used paper and pencils, Kitty. <laughs> and he would take just a piece of tracing paper and a Sharpie over the figure drawings to just take the Sharpie pen and very quickly to figure out where you want the black areas to go because I didn't know until he told me that Sharpie doesn't go through tracing paper. So you can shade as much as you want. It's not going to wreck the page underneath. It was things like that. And so I tried to carry that forward as I started working in commercial art and video games. And then in my film and TV production, we've tried really hard to uh, bring in people, younger people, people who might not have a film degree or an art degree, but have the mm -hmm. talent. And so we use our production to to give them a place to learn more and to play in departments they might not otherwise get to. So that's a be the the short answer is I think being in that studio, forming it with Aaron, getting to work with really really talented artists and writers was probably the most positive experience. And the other one would be uh, working with Stan Lee. I worked with Stan for 12, 13 years off and on as a contractor, and. Uh, you know, there's all kinds of, well, did Stan do this or didn't do that? I mean, I don't know. All I know is that he was really good to me. Um, always paid for lunch every time. <laughs> and honestly did teach me a lot of very specific things. I can't speak to what he did in the 1940s or 50s. And I never met, right. Jet, met Jack Kirby, so I don't have any idea. But I, I, I had a really good experience with Stan. Wonderful, wonderful. It's hard to top an experience with Stan Lee as uh, looking back yeah, on. Well, I'm working, working on it right now, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, now, you, you've also mentioned the connection with television and film, and I love the the cross-media thinking that you're talking about, because I think for me as a young reader, comics live there alongside television, film, and other visual media. I mean, they're different. I, I learned, uh, I, I started working in TV and film 16 years ago, and the way I got in was actually working with Stan on the TV show, Who Wants to Be a Superhero? Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. Real quickly, I had seen a Craigslist ad where they were doing a casting notice for the pilot, the sizzle, and I had been getting a lot of really good video game work off of Craigslist for many years. 
So I just sent them a note. You're doing a show about comics. You're probably going to want some art. An hour later, I got a panic phone call for the producer at the time. Oh, my God, has he going to be down here? And <clears throat> it turned into two seasons of work. On, I think we're on uh, NBC Universal. And so I started working in TV and film and getting a lot of sort of post-production art and not so much storyboarding, but art and layout and design work. And I realized that having done comics professionally in my 20s, mm -hmm. so I did it from age 20 to age 30, full time. I didn't go to art school, couldn't afford it, but it was the perfect training ground to then go to any other artistic discipline. If you've done comics in your 20s and you've done it professionally, I mean, I'll give you an example. Right now, I've been doing some fun uh, live portrait art at a sort of a high-end speakeasy distillery situation. So I'll be up on stage and I'm doing these portraits, you know, start to finish, pretty big ones in about 90 minutes. And people always come up, oh my God, how'd you do that so fast? And it's very gratifying, but what I always tell them is, I drew comics for a living. This is nothing. <laughs> right. <laughs> Faith and some hair. Big deal. I've had to do a Batman cover in three hours. Ain't so come on. So um, realizing that what I learned in comics, it translates almost one-to-one -to, -one to working in film and television, even if I'm not necessarily doing an art discipline like directing the TV pilots I've directed. I'm able to sit down and just sketch out some rough boards for the director of photography, but it also has taught me to be a better writer. And it's taught me to, how to deal with people in stressful situations because there's nothing more stressful than drawing comics. Mm -hmm. in my world. Mm -hmm. But also a lot of just the technical knowledge that I gained as a comic book reader and writer and artist and storyteller, that stuff pretty much lands right on top of film and TV and also in some cases, video games, you know? Yeah. So I learned a lot. Yeah. So along the way, you mentioned Stan Lee, but uh, other collaborators that you might give a shout out to, <clears throat> some of those positive collaborations that were part of the, and have been part of the experience. Yeah, Tom Simmons. Tom really put up with a lot of nonsense for me. Like I said, we went to college together. Uh -huh. We went to Eastern New Mexico University, which no one has ever heard of. <laughs> the four-year university in Portales. And it was near where we both were from, and it was a place we could afford to go. Um, I actually had a pretty pretty good graphic arts program from what I remember. But, uh, you know, Tom put up with my garbage for a lot of the years. I was a slow penciler, and he was a pretty fast anchor. Uh, but I I kept, you know, I had to make every elbow the greatest elbow that's ever been drawn. I'm like, Look, just draw it. Let me get the page in. <laughs> I wasn't really made for the grind of, like, getting a monthly comic. I never did a monthly comic. I just put it fast off. But he taught me a lot, too, about economy of line and how to sit down and get the work done. That was always my biggest problem and meet a deadline. Uh, you know, again, all the, all the folks I worked with in Studio Soros, a lot of great editors. Joey Cavalieri comes to mind. Joey was mm -hmm. the editor on the Elspel's Finest Supergirl and Backup Project. They did along with Maureen McTeague, who was the assistant editor. And I'm sure I made their lives hell. I didn't mean to. <laughs> I was young. I was a kid. I forget when that came out. I was 28, I think. I was yeah. a, boy and you know i'm sure i blew the deadline and everything uh so but really most everybody i mean most of my old friends in dc um other uh, folks like dan pedosi and dan was my anchor on the uh, the order of the defenders miniseries did for marvel and you know dan is an even better artist than i am way better frankly especially these days and he taught me a ton about the economy of line and a lot of it was just sort of figuring out by working with other artists, Carl Kiesel, who, who aimed to me on the Batgirl one shot I did, just mm -hmm. teaching me how to like not be so precious about every single line I put down, but try to take a more of a holistic view of the art and that mm -hmm. each page is part of a continuum. You know what I mean? And I think that I was approaching comics as an illustrator as opposed to a storyteller. And so they taught me over the years and the decades on how to think more like the story itself. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned deadlines, and I know the deadlines come fast and frequent in comics. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Wow. I um, I had not. The thing about comics that I wish people coming up would be aware of is that it is it's it's a wonderful art form. I'm not crazy about the business, and since I'm no longer in the business, I can say what I like. It doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. But the difficulty is that it was based around the monthly periodical model. And for most artists, especially pencilers, they wanted a page a day, page a day. Well, you know, people like John Romita Jr., who's one of my all-time favorite artists, could do three or four pages a day. And he's mm -hmm. been able to do that since he was 17. Now, part of it is that he was John Romita Sr.'s son. And I'm sure that's a genetic component to being able to do that. Because as I recall, John was pretty fast, too. And every panel was complete. Man, every background was there and bus stops and cars and the whole thing. I just wasn't that guy. My mom was a portrait artist. 
And so, you know, she'd spend two weeks on a portrait and, you know, I'm not blaming her, but I think that's where I got the meticulous nature of the art that I was doing. And that kind of art and the comics business don't necessarily come together. So the deadlines were a problem. I mean, my very first comic was Star Trek, the next generation annual number two for DC 1990. Mm -hmm. And I was given two and a half months by poor Bob Greenberger, who still speaks to you to this day. God bless him. I can't believe it. He's responsible for my career. And I blew the deadline completely. I think he gave me two and a half months. It took me over six. <laughs> and I was avoiding phone calls and making poor Tommy pick up the phone. And then I finally got done. And I had to learn that if I wanted to stay in the business, I had to meet deadlines. And I didn't really do it until I got into commercial illustration. Once I saw that they were paying me what I felt I was worth, the deadlines are no better. Uh, I definitely started straightening out and, and flying right. But yeah, I should have I should have been better about deadlines and comics. I just outed myself. But that's how it is. <laughs> well, I mentioned with something like uh, a Star Trek comic, you want to capture those likenesses. So the pressure's yeah. on for that as well with a final. Well, but they also, oh, sure. But they also, uh, and this is no slam on the folks I worked with, but Paramount in general were very uh, stingy back then with the references. So I actually did not have the reference I needed to do that job. So I had to sit in front of the TV and watch taped episodes of Next Gen to try to figure out what the set looked like. And so I feel like I get a little bit of uh, um, kindness for uh, not having... I didn't have the internet at the time, so I, like, I couldn't go, well, what does the bridge look like? What does Patrick Stewart look like? They sent me the writer's Bible and some headshots. So you know, I don't think I don't think blowing that deadline was entirely my fault. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, Yeah, that would be tough, trying to freeze frame and <clears throat> capture those images. Oh, yeah, yeah. In fact, I think the only other licensed project I did in when I was doing comics full time was the Superman Returns uh, adaptation. And mm -hmm. even then, Warner Brothers would not send me the reference I needed. Huh. Um, and then later, when I worked on Wonder Woman and then the Justice League movie, both of those, yet again, they wouldn't send me the reference I needed. And I said, well, how am I supposed to do a licensed project if you won't show me what the characters look like? Oh, just uh -huh. go on the Internet and look it up. Yeah, but you're still shooting the moot. All right. <laughs> So I kind of I kind of got out of it. It was just it was too much of a headache and didn't pay well. Yeah, I know. Those photos we don't want out there on the internet, just go get those. Go get those. Yeah. <laughs> well, actually the, the reference they sent me were PDFs of like, especially for Justice League, because I'm doing a bunch of promotional art. Mm -hmm. They sent me shots of all the costumes with my name in black letters stamped over every single photo in case I wanted to leak it, right? Well, right. The, my name was so big on these photos, I couldn't actually see what it was I was supposed to draw. So, <clears throat> I'm much happier doing what I'm doing now. Could have been a watermark. Could have been a watermark mm -hmm. instead of a stamp. Um, that's that's how they operate. That's why so, they're 500 million in the hole. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it's pretty wild. Yeah. Um, so, any character, storyline, or world that you would want to revisit at this point, if you, especially if you had time and. Yeah. Um, the the pay was there, which uh, from what I've heard, I, I'm totally getting that from the comics industry. Um, but yeah, but yeah comics is could... it's made to chew up kids in their 20s uh, who are desperate to draw Spider Man and see it on the rack. So a fellow artist of mine way back in the day said, I, I I'll know I've made it when I see my comic on the racks at 7 Eleven. And I remember thinking, well, I guess that's cool, but don't you want to aim a little higher, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> so I mean, I I got to draw the entire Marvel universe. I was a Marvel zombie. I wasn't really a DC guy when I was a kid. It's just that my art style was clean enough, and that's really what DC it kind of has been known for for decades. Go back and look at Kurt Swan. The stuff is beautiful, but it was a little stiff, and it was really, really clean. You know, whereas Marvel, you know, they hired in the eighties, they hired a guy like Bill Sienkiewicz, and Bill just would knock it out of the park, piece after piece after piece. But he was a bizarre, like fine art, weird pop art painter. Mm -hmm. And Marvel was the place where you could experiment with that. So when I finally got to go to Marvel, I got to draw the entire Marvel universe. And yeah, that's what I would love to tackle again, because I adore the Marvel stuff. I, I My goal when I was in high school was draw the X-Men with Chris Claremont writing it, like pretty much everybody else you know, who was reading comics at the time. Right, right. As far as DC, I really loved what we did with Elseworlds. It would be really we we did we spent eight months designing characters and designing the world. Tommy and I, I think we broke up the the design work uh, evenly. He's a gifted designer. He's really really good at costume design uh, and a very good writer as well. So probably the Elseworlds. I did really enjoy the tangent Joker stuff that mm -hmm. he and I and Carl Kiesel did when we came up with 
the stuff for that story, he and Tommy and I went to a place in Portland where we were all living at the time and got rather inebriated and came <laughs> up with the story and then sober and had to sit down and draw it. But we had a blast. <laughs> that's one of the most fun comics I've ever done was the tangent stuff. And that's that's Dan Jurgens putting that together and asking me to come do it. So just a lot. I mean, there's there's it's it'd be hard to pick. Yeah. You know, yeah. but probably if I had to pick, it'd be the Elseworld stuff at DC. Yeah. yeah. As I mentioned, among my favorites uh, as well, and I just love the creativity of those stories. The oh yeah, the possibilities they open up. Oh, yeah, definitely. And people seem to dig them. It sounds like James Gunn and uh, Pete Safran, who are running the new DC films thing. It sounds like they're going to be doing some things. I don't know if they're going to call them else worlds, but they're like, well, mm-hmm. here's our main story over here, and here's our weird stuff over here. You know, like when Mignola did that Gotham by Gaslight, which I think kind of kicked it off. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I'm kind of hoping they do some really off the wall stuff with the DC films. Yeah. The Elseworlds was my favorite. Yeah. Yeah. That would be cool to see for sure. Um, so what do you envision now in your creative journey? What's next? And uh, along with that, where can fans go to follow along with what you do? Well, you know, for many years I, I worked in video games, but I was a contractor. So I worked like at LucasArts and I worked for the reformed Atari. Did a lot of work for Ubisoft, like on the Tom Clancy's games. Um, and just stumbled into that after the comics thing kind of went away because, you know, I've been working on paper and then, uh, you know, mm-hmm. decades ago got into digital art. Mm-hmm. So I've been digital for a very long time. Um, that led me into deciding to form a film and TV production up in Portland, which still exists. I'm in LA, but they're up in Portland. Mm-hmm. I'm creating TV pilots and uh, got into directing and writing. And then I shot several of those and we sold a couple. And it's been been nice to learn about that. Uh, I'm getting ready to direct my first feature film, but of course everyone's on strike. Right, so right. So that, that put a bit of a, a, a stick in the mud. That's okay, I'm a union supporter and I totally, I'm not, I'm not a member of a union, but I totally understand why they're striking. So for the moment, I'm actually going back to one of the pilots that I shot and, and uh, optioned a couple of years ago called Cyber Fist which is a love letter to shows like Knight Rider and Airwolf and Street Hawk, all the stuff that I grew up on as a, as a college kid, mm-hmm. uh, high school kid, actually. <clears throat> and so we shot a pilot for it right before COVID. Didn't know COVID was going to happen. Got an option to then COVID kind of reset everything. Well, I own it. Like I own the word, which is really weird. I went to trademark it. Like no one was using the word cyber fist. And so like I snapped up the, the web domain, snapped up the trademark. Great, great. And so we're doing a Kickstarter that I think launches here in a week or two doing action figures. And so I got to design all the action figures. Um, got to, I'm doing the package art actually right now to kind of put it together. And we'll see how that goes. Um, I'm uh, also doing this bizarre thing at the speakeasy. It's called The Obscure. It's just theobscure.com. And if anybody's in L.A., Come check it out. I just hang out on stage. They feed me a little too much alcohol. And I do these <laughs> portraits in front of people who come and like are trying the alcohol and kind of learning about it. It's, a, it's, a, it's an experience. It's much more than a speakeasy. And I, my girlfriend took me there about seven months ago and I had the experience and they wanted someone on stage doing art. And I thought, well, I work at home. It'd be nice to get out of the house. And mm-hmm. it's kind of turned into a sort of a fine art career sideline. I just had my first gallery show at the Siler Gallery in La Jolla last weekend and then blew everything out. Couldn't believe it. So it's, yeah, I'm looking for, going to be doing some gallery shows here in LA and it's turning into a thing. What that demonstrates is that, you know, I had the TV and film stuff, which is kind of stalled. And then I was doing commercial art for Microsoft and then the tech layoffs killed my Microsoft projects. Mm-hmm. So, but because I did comics in my twenties, I still have all those skills and I can just sit down and draw stuff on paper. I, I had people on my Instagram who were, arguing with me about when I kept saying that AI sucks and you know, if you're an AI artist, you're not an artist. I stand mm-hmm. behind that. You're not an artist. If you, oh, I'm an AI artist, I type in prompts. My challenge right. to them was like, you had a sketchbook and a, a ballpoint pen, turn off the lights and light a candle. Can you draw something? No? Okay. Mm-hmm. And so it's the only part of the art is subjective argument that I will fight over. I don't care what your style is. I don't care if you're a professional or an amateur. If you can sit down and draw something, it doesn't matter how good you are. I tell kids at school this all the time. Can you draw? Do you like to draw? You're an artist. That's it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Keep Love honing it. your skill if you want to try and do it professionally, but don't ever, don't ever let anybody tell you you're not unless you're doing the AI nonsense. So, right, uh, right. But it's been nice to be able to go back to my roots and sit and just draw on paper and work on my own. I hate to use the term IP but it's the world we're in. Right, right. Uh, because having done comics, 
That's why comics has, that's why I'm really grateful for the time that I had having a career that young in comics, because now I'm a one-stop shop. Now I can just do it. Soup to nuts, you know? Okay. So the short answer to all that is I've got the Cyberfist toy Kickstarter coming out in a couple of weeks. We are in pre-production on a feature. It's a horror film, which scares the crap out of me. Uh, <laughs> I hope we get to do it. We're just going to have to wait and see what happens with the strike, but that's coming. Um, and then I've got one or two other things in the works that I probably shouldn't talk about yet, but I'm, I'm definitely, I'm still up to my neck. So it's good. Awesome. Awesome. It sounds like lots of, lots of wonderful things on the way. Looking forward to the feature film, sending good vibes. Just stay there. Busy. Yeah. Know. The best yeah. place to, to find out about this stuff is to go to cyberfist.com. It's all one word or matthaley.com, all one word. And that's where everything happens. All right. Sounds great. I'll be sure to link both. And in the video, there will be a pop-up box with those links. Um, oh, great. Yeah. Yeah. And glad to share, share about the Kickstarter. And uh, It's going to be fun. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, I, I'm not a big toy collector, but once I got the designs and we got the prototypes back in, I got kind of excited. So, like, tonight I'm sitting here finishing the package art, and the 12 year old me is really excited. So, I hope you oh, love like it. it. Love it. Love it. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, well, thank you so much, Matt. I appreciate the conversation and glad to be in touch. Glad to share about your work. Thank you, Jason. I appreciate it. This was fun.